Good evening, my name is Lauren Meister. Welcome to the Cochrane and District Chamber of Commerce Municipal Election Debate. We have 16 town council candidates joining us here tonight. We're live at Cochrane Toyota, and a big thank you, of course, to Cochrane Toyota for allowing us to use this space tonight. So before we get things started, I want to remind you that when you're heading to the polls next Monday, October 18th, that you're not only voting for town council, you're also going to be voting for the trustees sitting on your school board for Rocky View Schools or for the Calgary Catholic School Division. So unfortunately, because of COVID-19 restrictions and the timing, we weren't able to host school trustees uh, tonight, but we wanted to make sure to take a moment and uh, you can find more information about who is running on the local school divisions and you can find more information about all of the candidates on the municipal election page on CochraneNow.com. So now I'm gonna introduce you to our moderator for the evening, Stephen Sims. Uh, Stephen is uh, the retired vice president of a global Fortune 500 company. Having worked in over 20 countries, he's called Cochrane home now for the past 10 years. He's a local business owner who is an active member on a number of boards and associations in our town, including the Rotary Club of Cochrane, the Community Futures Centre West Board, Bow River's Edge Campground Society, and the Glen Eagles Community Association. So we're going to throw it over to Stephen, and he'll explain the rules of the evening and the debate and how everything's going to work tonight. Thanks so much, Lauren, and thank you, Cochrane, now for allowing me to participate this evening. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly go through the format so you all understand how it will work. As you can appreciate, with 16 candidates in the room, it's not possible to have all of you debate each other at the same time. So we have broken you up into groups of three. And because there's only 16, there will be two groups of two. You each chose a number when you came in that was random. The questions have been assigned to the numbers randomly. We have no way of knowing who was going to get what question. So it is 100% random. There will be six questions that you have received already from Cochrane Now. We wanted to give you an opportunity to think about those questions. There will also be six questions from the public that uh, the public have submitted those to Cochrane Now and uh, we will ask you. We will rotate between one Cochrane Now question, one from the public, and each time we change questions, we are going to change the people who are standing at the front answering. Uh, the the uh, questions will have a one minute preamble from myself and then you will each have two minutes to answer the question and at 90 seconds, with 30 seconds remaining, uh, my lovely assistant, Leslie, will uh, ring the bell. And that's your notification that you have 30 seconds to start to wrap. We are on a tight timeline this evening, so we ask you to respect the two minutes. So at the second bell, we will tell you to please uh, end your comments. If you continue to go on, we'll just cut your mic. So we'll hear you in the room, but no one online will hear you. So uh, we have that power. It's wonderful. We also ask that you respect each other, that you be civil and be respectful of what you're here to do tonight. Um, this evening, we do hope that you will share how you will tackle the issues that arise in running a town. Uh, I would suggest you use your time wisely. Uh, do not use your time to give us your biography. People can go on your social media sites, your websites, and figure all out. You can go to Cochrane now. You're, you're all there. So uh, please do not spend your precious two minutes telling us about your background. Instead, uh, speak to the question. Speak to what you're going to do about it and what your views are on it. Uh, there will be either two or three candidates up there, so feel free to debate. If you all agree, well, we can't hug each other because it's COVID, but you know, we'd, we'd hope there'd be a little bit of excitement and maybe a little bit of debate uh, with, with your views. And we're looking for you to demonstrate your knowledge and the actions that you would take in exercising your responsibility as a counselor. So on that note, I am going to ask our first question and I'm going to call uh, Morgan, Tara, and Todd to the front, please. Very 
Perfect. All right, thank you. So the town of Cochrane, and in fact the entire world, has gone through, and in fact continues to go through, difficult and divisive times due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this has basically shook the world to its core. So the question is, how will you work to create greater community togetherness and begin to heal the divisiveness that seems prevalent today? And I will start with Morgan. All right. With the million dollar question to begin the evening, the uh, issue that's on everybody's mind. So the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has, uh, it's been something that has changed our lives like nothing we've ever seen before. And as a representative of our community, a community leader, I think that our most important role in all of this is helping people find some common ground some, uh, so we can start developing an optimistic feeling to build up a more positive future in Cochrane. And it's unfortunate that in past months and years, the issues become so divisive. It's become us versus them, black versus white, uh, pro-vax versus anti-vax. And it, this is, there's not two sides to this. We are all in this together. And the other thing is, yes, there's one pandemic, but there is not one experience. Everybody is experiencing this in a very different way. And I want to be a leader in our community who's listening to people, understanding where everybody is coming from. If you talk to somebody in the healthcare industry, say an ICU nurse or a doctor, they're going to have an experience where they tell you about all the problems and the tragedies that are, they're facing every single day in the healthcare system. If you talk to a small business owner, somebody who's been staring down the barrel of a gun facing bankruptcy for years, they're going to talk to you about a different set of problems. And if you talk to a parent whose child's uh, school life and their recreation life has been turned upside down, they're going to have a different set of experiences and problems. And the important thing for us to understand is everybody's experiences and everybody's problems are very real in that person's life. And I truly want to be a voice for understanding all sides and helping our community pave a more optimistic, a brighter future. And I, one thing we do all have in common is I know all of us want to come out this, the other side, back to the old way we used to live, the old normal. Thanks. I'm Morgan Nagel. Thanks, Morgan. I uh, realized as I was sitting here that I neglected to state that after your two minutes, and we've gone through each of you with two minutes, you will have one minute rebuttal each. Mm -hmm. So you do have a little bit more time. Todd. Hey. Good evening, Cochran. Um, my, how I look at this is we do need to support the government and the way they're doing it right now is Alberta Health Services Enforced Current Restrictions Exemptions Program is one that I'm okay with. Um, without alienating those who, for personal reasons, don't want to get vaccinated or they can't be vaccinated for medical reasons. So we've got to be careful not to alienate people that are in that boat. Um, for greater community togetherness, this can start by council making decisions going forward that keep this in mind. And I think we can come together that way. Okay? Good for me. Efficient use of time. I always approve of efficiency. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Tara McFadden. I'm one of your town councillors, and I've had the honour to serve you since 2007. And uh, we're talking about COVID, um, the impacts of that. And uh, when, uh, when our council was elected four years ago and everyone was stepping up to run, to represent, to solve problems, uh, the visions that we were bringing to the table as elected officials was, was how do we create that next Cochrane, the future for Cochrane, and a lot of the plans and visions we had for the greatness of Cochrane uh, got completely sidelined by COVID-19, like it did for so many people. And as Morgan said, I mean, we're all having a different experience with COVID. Um, it's a hard time. It's not a future that we could predict. And we are all in the same boat in that we have to deal with it. And uh, some of us have different ways of dealing with it. Um, and I know in my own family, in my own friend network, um, it has called that, that divisiveness. It's an emotional issue for people. Um, and it's probably the most important thing we're going to face in 100 years. And so the way to get through it, though, and the reason that uh, we are, of course, elected is to be leaders in our community. And that's what we can do in this, is we can lead, and we can lead by showing empathy, we can lead by listening, and we can lead by providing results and uh, solutions to those problems where we can. The problem itself is global, um, but we can find solutions here and now. So thank you, Cochran. Okay, thank you, Tara. Morgan, you have one more minute to 
not debate or, <laughs> or rebut because there was no debate, but uh, you have another minute. Well, I appreciate to have another minute. Um, I don't have anything to debate or rebut uh, with my colleagues up here this evening. And the, I, I think it's, uh, it's great we're on the same page. We want to find a positive, optimistic path through this. And I would add that one thing I've found out on the campaign trail over the past few months is when you really talk to people and listen to them, everybody is feeling much more hostile and much less divisive than mainstream media and the internet would lead you to believe. I think everybody is in a much better state and a much more hopeful state than people realize. And we, as a community, we cannot allow the negativity, the fear, and the divisiveness to creep into our real lives. Thanks. Thanks, Morgan. Todd? Hi again, Cochran. Um, as Morgan was saying, we really don't have anything to rebut here between the three of us. I think we presented pretty honest and straightforward in that part. Um, myself, I've lived in Cochrane and worked for municipalities for the past 10 years. Um, I'll cut to the chase with that. Um, and helping make the right decision for the community and for the town, we have to make sure it takes everybody's health and safety into account. And so a lot of times that's how your decision's made when you're working around the table. And that's good for me. Thanks. Thanks, Todd. Tara? So I think maybe a slight disagreement, but only perhaps an emphasis. Uh, what Morgan was saying is we all want to get back to the old way of living. And I think uh, COVID-19 has actually taught us some things and taught us different ways of doing things. Um, and I think we should kind of take those key learnings and advance them into the future. Uh, we need to be planning for the future and looking for the future. And one of the things I certainly learned through COVID is how important our, uh, our recreation spaces are to us and our parks and our ability to recreate and come together through recreation. So that's been a, um, a growing focus for me over the years, but a focus looking ahead, uh, what I'd like to accomplish in the next term. Um, and additionally, when we talk about you know, public engagement, um, we used to you know, have discussions about what was the best time to have council meetings so people could come and engage with us. But COVID-19 has uh, enabled us, empowered us, driven us to adopt technologies like Zoom. And so we can have a forum like this so that more than you know, 150 people can traditionally watch a forum. But thanks to adopting technology and the new ways of approaching things, um, people are able to engage with us and we're more transparent. Okay, thanks, Tara. Okay, thank you. Okay. Do we get evaluated on how well we clean? Yes. We're, we're going to audit that. Okay, so I would ask Patrick and Alex. And there's only two of you this question. Okay. This is a public question, and it comes from Kathy. And she asks, what are the top two issues facing Cochrane and what would you do about those two issues? Am I missing where we screen? <laughs> it doesn't go up. It doesn't go up. Okay. Well, you want that one? It's a little solid. All right, sure. I'll switch it. Or you can take it out and hold it if you'd like. Sure. But I'll switch it out. Thanks. Okay, Patrick. Uh, the top two issues facing Cochrane. I'm uh, happy to have uh, represented Cochrane since 2017 in the last council. Um, the top two issues facing Cochrane are uh, the way that we grow, our ma managing our growth, and our uh, infrastructure uh, deficits that I see. Um, in, in short, I think when we grow as a community, it should benefit current residents. It shouldn't be to the detriment of current residents. So we need to have a better look at the way we're growing and making sure that our infrastructure is keeping up with it. Um, traffic was something I'm proud of the way our last council dealt with. I think we did a lot of very useful things there and I think given another four years if executed and managed properly, um, that's a subject that we can uh, be proud of where we are with. So in short, uh, managing our growth and catching up uh, with traffic infrastructure. 
Okay. Thank you. Alex? Yeah, my answer is actually going to be quite similar. Um, actually, it's just one really issue that's top issue, and that's infrastructure. It's obvious that the town has not been able to keep pace with its growth, and that it touched many, many areas recreation, 24 uh, 7 health care, ambulance services, um, tra traffic, as we all know and have experienced. A lot of those issues are, are part of the infrastructure. And I would also indicate, you know, water water and sewage for, for years to come <clears throat> are part of those issues as well. So infrastructure is clearly something that we need to be able to focus on, and that's a kind of an um, umbrella of activities. The other is, I think, growth, managing our growth. So we have enough residential development on the books to last us for at least the next 20 years. And I think partner, partnering with, um, with our county partners would be to, the goal of being able to recognize and, uh, and work together with that growth. So infrastructure, clearly, uh, as it relates to traffic, 24-7 health care, ambulance services, recreation, uh, dog parks, or you know, bike lanes, you name it. And we just need to be able to be in a position to plan ahead. So one of the things I would talk about, for example, is a traffic study. You know, while we're, we're doing what we are right now as it relates to the current situation, are we really preparing for the next 20 years? So from an infrastructure perspective, we should be looking at this through a 20-year lens. Okay, thank you, Alex. No problem. So again, uh, no real debate there. Uh, so you still have another minute to add to, clarify, or speak with greater clarity potentially to the second half of Kathy's question, which is what would you do about the issues that you've identified? Go ahead, Patrick. First. Um, so I'll add to, I suppose, um, perhaps uh, Mr. Reed and I agree quite a bit on these two topics. I, I would say to address our growth problems, which I would say is our number one topic right now, the way we grow. I would say that we need to start evaluating new communities that we bring on in a more long-term lens, much like we just talked about with traffic. Uh, if we we're to look at the way we grow in a 30-year lens, I'm worried that we have a fiscal insolvency problem where our new developments aren't bringing in as much tax base as they're going to cost if we look over a 30-year lens. And so I'd like to evaluate things in a more broad, broad spectrum sort of a way and make sure that when we grow, current Cochranites are uh, receiving a benefit and not a net loss to how we do things. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Alex? Yeah, in the last minute I have, I would just say that, uh, you know, we've been on the right path this last four years. Um, admittedly, it's not gone as quickly as we'd like. COVID, the 18 months of COVID has kind of hampered that, that development. But the reality is we're on the right path and we're doing the right things and we're moving in the right direction. And, uh, you know, to Patrick's point, I think we've got to be able to find a balance between the non-residential and the residential tax to be able to offset the kind of I would say lower income uh, tax return on in terms of the residential development to be able to help be able to cover the cost of that infrastructure, but definitely looking through a 20 year lens. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you both. Uh, can I get to the front? Dan, Erica, and Deborah. You want me to clean it first? Or leave it? No, they just cleaned it. That's good. I thought it was back in the cleaning business. <laughs> I'm going to do the Dina Hinshaw. <laughs> You might want to turn your name tag around. That works better. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so with all that continues to be uncovered regarding the relationship with Canada's Indigenous community and to address the legacy of residential schools and advance truth and reconciliation, it is important that we understand your view. So as a counselor, how would you enact progressive change in our relations with the Stony Nakoda Nation and help enact the 94 calls to action? We'll start at this end this time. Deborah. Hi, I'm Deborah Murphy. Um, I've, uh, in one of the questions that came out about um, the Indigenous was there was a 94 calls to action and I had never heard of it until the questions came in so I looked it up 
and obviously didn't have enough time to go through it all. But there was a few um, areas, number 57 and number 77, only mentioned the municipality. Um, when it comes to togetherness, I see us all as Canadians. Um, I often say that Canada is a meeting of the nations. We're from every nation, every culture, all kinds of tribes. And I even have a little bit of a blog where on my um, webpage where it talks about um, the Indians and the First Nations or the Aborigines, whatever um, people like to call them. I, I love them. I love the colorfulness of them. And I think they have yet to come into their own. And so um, I never excluded them. I don't think anybody ever did. And um, I think healing is necessary. And in the healing, um, the person that caused the hurt must acknowledge that they caused the hurt. And the person that was hurt um, receives that acknowledgement and forgives. That begins the healing. OK, thanks. Erica. Thank you. Um, this question really does speak to my heart. I grew up in an area with 17 reserves around our community and going to school um, with my, my um, with a, all varieties of people. And with Truth and Reconciliation, we did see a bit of a pause and a stop. And so I would definitely would like to, like starting with those two, yes we could, but more so I want to start with talking to the areas that are closest to us, such as Morley asking, how would you like to see this community help you out? You know, it, it all, every, with everything we've already talked about, even with COVID, it all starts with a conversation and with listening and furthering that conversation. So that's where I would like to start, is seeing where they would like to start with the 94 questions and where they would like to see us as a community go. Okay, thank you. Dan? This was actually one of the questions that I was actually a little bit afraid of, just because I am a middle-class white person that is speaking to an untold amount of hate, um, disenfranchisement, and racism, and for and colonialism for a number of years. And for many, I'm going to embody that. Um, now, that being said, there's only so much well, there's a lot we can do, and this, the, the call, for, um, call for immediate action is, is one of those. I think the, be the worst thing that we can do as, as a, a council would be to sit there and say, just wait. That, I, you know, and, uh, when I was in UVic, I was taking social work, and I had the privilege of taking some education around reg residential schools. I'm still amazed that, for the most part, that's still not even in our school system here. And yet, here I am 20 years after my degree, and we're still asking people, the, the Aboriginal people, to wait. Uh, that's an insult, and we need to move past that. So what I want to do right off the bat here is I want to do what we can as a town council to immediately implement those, those, uh, those calls to action. And now, there's a, a big provincial authority issue here, but that doesn't stop town council from penning a letter to the province saying, we want action, we want it now. If there's anything to do with interpretation, we need to reach out to the people that are affected. 30 seconds, that's what that bell is. And that's where I'll end it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so another minute. Well, I, I would just say maybe it's because I'm an immigrant and um, I appreciate the opportunity I got to become a Canadian citizen and I assume that everybody in this country are Canadian citizens and we're all treated equally um, under, under the law. We all have the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and um, I, I personally don't see any hate or exclusiveness. Um, any of the, the native people that I've met here, I enjoy their culture the same as I do an Italian or a French person or anybody else. So to me, I have no exclusion of them. I have inclusion. It's all togetherness, and um, so I don't see any hate. Um, but I do feel that um, as we accept each other all as Canadians, and then they are part of the culture. They're part of the color. We're the spice of life. We come from all, all nations and places, and uh, spice of life. Okay, thanks. Erica. One more thing I'd like to add for myself is, 
yes, we've just had Orange Shirt Day and it's been recognized nationally. Um, let's look at having more cultural events like that. We have the opportunity uh, here working with the Stony Dakota to be able to have more events like that. Uh, like I said, where I grew up, we had tons of events throughout the year. Uh, which brought us more enlightenment to the situations and whatnot. So that, that there would be another opportunity I would look for. Okay, thank you. Dan? I'm going to, you know, I think it's, again, I'll go back to an insult here. At the end of the day, there is a national day for truth and reconciliation. And what does the province do? We don't even give a day off. We don't even give enough time for people to act, actively reflect on what happened here. I cannot imagine turning around and finding my family's graves in unmarked graves throughout Canada. And this is, we can't even give a day to reflect. The bottom line is, just because we personally don't see that, my experience is if you ask the people, they'll tell you the stories that, do ex that this does exist. When you say the people, you mean the Aboriginal? Yes. Community? Thank you. Thanks, all. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'd like to ask uh, Paul and Ryan to come up, please. There'll also only be two of you for this question. So this is a public question from a gentleman named Dan. The proposed Cochrane River Wave Park has been a hot topic here in our town. Are you for or against it, and why? So I'll start with Paul. Good evening, everybody. It's on. Oh. You won't hear it in here. <laughs> I'm Paul Singh. Uh, thank you for the question. I've been uh, so much uh, questions regarding the wave, or, wave, wave Park in the Riverview. And to make that decision, it won't be one single decision made by myself. It'll be a council decision made by community involvement. Studies need to be done. And there's lots, lots behind it, like environmental studies, how it's going to affect the infrastructure, how it's going to be impacting the neighboring communities, parking, and do we have resources to support that? So saying that I will support it or no, there are lots behind the scene before we can even make a decision, and it will be a decision made by council as a whole, not just one particular decision by myself. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Ryan? All right, hi everyone, my name is Ryan McMillan. When it comes to the wave park and uh, those issues, I uh, believe that there's been a lot of outcry from the community over this, and I would say that we have heard loud and clear that um, there's a lot of opposition towards it. Where do I stand on it personally? Uh, the way I look at it is that I think it is a great expenditure and I'm not seeing the potential for it gain back. Um, that's just on the financial side of it. I think we still need to hear back on uh, the environmental reports as Paul was mentioned here. I think that's very wise to take uh, those factors into account as to how it'll affect the habitat. But with a wave park that's already in Kananaskis with a uh, potential one coming into Calgary, uh, I think it's too niche of a market and too great of a investment for what it'll, it'll actually benefit Cochrane, especially for such a limited season as well. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, we didn't have to worry about you going over your time. None, <laughs> of, no, none of you. <laughs> we'll be done in no time. Here. No, no problem. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. <laughs> so, Paul, you yes. have another minute. As Ryan said, like, uh, I would say as a collective decision, as a community, more engagement needed. And my personal opinion would be, I would not support any Bayfront Park if it's damaging environment and if it's damaging like the natural habitat or it won't be beneficial for taxpayers' money. I won't support as a personal, but as you mentioned as a team, working as a team in the council, it would be a collective decision and 
lots of studies, lots of behind the scene has to be done before even I say, oh, I'm going to say no or I'm going to say yes about it. So I'll wait for that to make an informed decision as a council. I will wait for the results to be there. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Paul. All right, Ryan. Anything nah. else to add? No, nah, man, I'm good. <laughs> I'm against it. Let's carry on. Okay. Next question. We might be breaking COVID rules, but I think everyone needs to give everybody a hug. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Okay, let's move on. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Okay, Alan, Bruce, and Samantha. All right, so our town has grown substantially over the last 20 years. A growing community is certainly a healthy community. Growth and development brings more business and certainly opportunities, but it also, there is a need for it to be planned and managed. And how would you propose to increase the non-residential tax base, improve Cochrane's economic diversity, and all the while maintain Cochrane's quality of place and identity. And I'll start with Samantha. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Samantha. Um, I think in order to manage our growth, it's a little bit about uh, quality versus quantity. Um, in some cases, it's a fine balance of not hindering the growth, but also growing with integrity. So in regards to the residential tax base, we currently sit at 13%. Um, lots of other communities in uh, Alberta, some of them tip 45% or 44 I think was the highest, uh, being Leduc. Um, I'm kind of a doer and I would reverse market us actually. I would figure out what the gaps are in our current uh, residential tax base and I would pitch those businesses and jobs that are missing. Um, kind of highlight Cochrane as the wonderful place that we are and all the things that we have to offer. And I think being a part of the CMRB is actually going to be um, to our benefit for this because the growth will be driven at us. So I actually think that some of these businesses are going to reach out on their own because we are the desired growth um, area. Um, also, I think, like I said, I would reach out based on needs to the, the missing gaps. Um, but like I said, I'm a marketer by trade, so I kind of feel like that's kind of what we're missing right now, is just marketing ourselves a little bit differently and innovatively. Okay, thanks, Samantha. Alan. Good evening, Cochrane candidates. Uh, so this issue is uh, pretty near and dear to me. Um, it's, it's something that, uh, that I ran for council on, um, or am running. Um, it almost seems like that we're, we're, we're built on a, uh, a pyramid scheme of, of bringing in four or 5,000 people every cycle to, to, to keep our tax rates the same. We are going to hit a limit, and uh, this is something that we need to make sure that we challenge administration to address. So this is accomplished through investigation of economic development opportunities. It's important for councillors to attend conferences such as the Alberta Urban Municipality Association, or even the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. These are not social galleries, these are networking opportunities where representatives of Cochrane find out what has been working with other communities and bring the best ideas home for administration of Ponder Over. We need to continue to foster relationships such as we have with Garmin as our world becomes more technology driven and overall we need to encourage more commercial growth, possibly through short term tax incentives or other ways that attract new businesses and being cognizant of protecting those businesses that we already have. Okay, thanks, Al. Bruce. Thank you, I'm uh, Bruce Townley, one of your candidates for Cochrane Council. Um, I think the first and most important step is to start setting our priorities and start asking questions. Do we want to impact our green spaces, our environment, our natural assets? What type of businesses do we want to attract that will create local, well-paying jobs? Do we want businesses that will entice our residents to spend locally? How do we make Cochrane much more business friendly? What can we do to make viable businesses want to be in Cochrane? 
I've been fortunate enough over the last uh, week or two, I've had uh, an opportunity to speak to business owners who would consider setting up in our town. We need to reach out, engage these companies to develop a business friendly, strategic and successful process in order for them to want to set up and build and set up their businesses in our town. Thank you. Thank you. Samantha, another minute. <clears throat> Um, I guess one thing I want to add is that I guess to manage our growth we have to think a little bit about what a small town is. Um, what does that mean to us? Because we are a small town, or we hope to be, um, but we are growing at an exponential rate. So I guess some of the questions I have around this responsible growth is how independent do we actually want to be? Because if we have this fairy tale idea of greater independence, um, from the outside world, then we have to do a lot to step up to bring the businesses here so that we don't have to go to Calgary to shop. Um, but the reality is that a lot of people who live in Cochrane do work in Calgary. So I think um, bringing things here that we don't have will keep people in our community and also those businesses can employ our people so they don't have to go to Calgary for jobs. Okay, thank you. Al? From what I'm hearing from Kelly from the Chamber of Commerce, Cochrane is a place that businesses want to be. Um, two years ago, you'd be walking down the street and, and there'd be for lease signs in the windows. Those aren't there any longer. I, I see no issues with, with Cochrane being able to sell itself. Um, but we need to be cognizant that, that we manage this growth. Um, I'm hearing along the way uh, during campaigning that, that people, people are afraid that, that we're, we're we're, we're developing too quick, or, or, or we're developing in, in, in a way that possibly might be affecting them. And, and we really need to reach out to the citizens and make sure that we address that. Okay, thank you. Bruce? Thanks. Yeah, I, uh, I agree uh, with uh, my two counterparts up here uh, on most of the issues. I think the big thing is we need to engage our, our Chamber of Commerce, our Cochrane Tourism Association, and other key partners to collectively put our heads together, what can we do to attract better business? And that would also align ourselves with the province to see what they can offer, what they can provide, um, you know, as far as uh, ideas and grants and other opportunities for funding to, uh, to um, attract the appropriate businesses that we need to see here in Cochrane. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. Okay, thank you. Give me half a second, please. Okay, this will uh, also be two people, and it would be uh, Brandon and Marnie. Okay, this is a question from the public, from a fellow by the name of Ryan. Cochranites are divided on the future of the multi-use area by the Spray Lakes Rec Center next to the Bow River. Some want it to remain as an off-leash area, while others want to eliminate the off-leash portion. Is there a compromise to be had for both sides, and what is your stance on the future of this area? We'll start with you, Brandon. Hi Cochran, my name is Brandon Cruz. I think it's important that we leave all natural assets uh, alone. Uh, environmentally, uh, our impacts that we've lost over the years have been quite substantial. So um, the development that we've had, we look at Presidents, the hill that we had there, uh, everywhere, Sunset, Heartland, uh, Heritage Hills. We've largely lost all of that green space uh, when it comes down to the Jinnamu Fulman Park. Uh, it's kind of along the exact same lines. 
the River Wave Park. I have no, um, I guess, rebuttal in, in regards to when it comes to saying on my own personal side that I do not support the Wave Park. Um, I largely feel that the cost of the taxpayer, uh, the ecosystem, we've had a lot of um, groups go in who have looked at the fish habitat, who have looked at re-stabilizing uh, the banks, and I think a lot of that's going to be lost if we continue to, uh, to start pulling away at that. So that's what I have for that. Thank you. Marnie. I'm Marnie Fideko, and uh, I always hope compromise can be found in our community. Um, you're taking on two different groups that have two very passionate sides. You have people who are out there to bike, and obviously want to expand our bike trails and um, you know be able to have uh, their children ride safely and all that. But then you also have off-leash dog walkers, and that's another passionate group of people. Um, in this particular topic, I think that we have to be careful to not necessarily choose with one side or the other. We need to hear from both sides, and we need to do a lot of public engagement. Um, I would hope that when we look at what kind of solution could be found, it's something that both sides want. My concern is that as much as we have people who want to ride, we have very limited off-leash areas here in our town. And until some of those spaces probably can be developed in our future, uh, then I would say maybe that's something that we could look at by kind of offsetting that park and making it more of a divisive area where both can uh, can use it functionally. But I think until that happens, I think that we have to be careful on how we develop those areas. Okay, thank you. Brandon? Yeah, so I'd go back and I'd, I'd probably say, I'm again, I'm not um, in favor of it. I, I do believe we have a lot of off-leash dog parks. So the ones that are down by Smitty's, we have one in Sunset. Uh, our, our river uh, trail is actually quite extensive. It's quite long. And again, I, I, I believe that we just need to leave it alone. Um, there's no better way to say it. I'm not, uh, like I said, I'm not going to look at, you know, taking one thing away from another. Um, again, I, th I think we just need to leave it alone. Okay. Martin? My last comment would be, what does the community want? And I think that's what we're forgetting. We're elected to represent the, the voices of our community. We need to stop, we need to listen, do proper public engagement, and then collectively as a group sitting around the table as council, that's when we decide to make that decision. I think to stand up here and say that you just don't support something without having that knowledge, it's probably not necessarily the wisest thing that we could do. And I would disagree with that if we still have time. <laughs> just because yeah, I... Uh, we have all kinds of time. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, that's But great. we are breaking protocol here. Yeah, no, that's... Um, and I, I think the, the important thing to note is that I've, I've done door knocking. I've been out in the community since uh, a lot of people would know at the end of March. Um, a lot of people tell me that they do not want our natural spaces to go anywhere. Um, so it's not a fact that I have not consulted anybody in the community. I've spoke to hundreds and hundreds of people. I've probably received around 300 emails in regards to this. Um, and again, I, I can't break off of that. I think there's going to be a, a section of people that do want to see it, and there's going to be a, a number of people that don't want to see it. Um, but the reality is, is that even though I'd be representing the community as a whole, I have to respect my hometown. Uh, I was born and raised here, and I think that's important for me. And irregardless of um, maybe everybody's views, I have to also look at my own as well. So it's my own plus the community. And largely what I'm hearing is that people want the natural spaces left alone. Okay. In fairness, Marty? Yeah, I would say, you know what? Our voice as a counselor is not about our personal opinion. It is about the opinion of the people that we represent. Okay. And I'll leave it at that. Perfect. Marty, don't go anywhere. You're actually staying up. Okay. Uh, thanks, Marty. Good to go. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Susan and Ryan, would you like to come up and join Marty, please? Okay, um, much has been said over the years regarding Cochrane's relationship with Rocky View County. Cochrane and RVC need to seek compromise and they need to work together to create mutual win-win agreements. As a member of council, how would you contribute your specific expertise to advance a progressive relationship with Rocky View County? I'll start with you, Ryan. Sure thing. Uh, Ryan McMillan for town council. Uh, so in regards to our relationship with Bow Valley, or sorry, with, uh, <laughs> with Rocky View County, uh, it's very important that we do recognize that we are part of a larger whole, and we do find ways that we can work with them 
And so what do I bring to the table with that? Um, I do bring the fact that I do have a small business in town. I am a um, husband, I'm a father, and um, I think I'm a great communicator and someone who likes to listen, as well as to, stri to strive to find um, a win-win for both scenarios. And so in working with uh, Rocky View County, I think there's lots of ways in which we can find, um, uh, that we can actually find ways to, to benefit each other, uh, to work off each other's expertise, uh, and to win in those scenarios. Thank you. Thanks, Sorry, Susan. Good evening, Cochran. I'm Susan Flowers. I really appreciate getting this question because it's so important to us. We need to build good relationships with our neighbors, and we have to be trustworthy and be good partners so that they trust us. We have a lot in common with Rocky View County. We need to work together to make sure we use our water resources properly, our underground pipelines, um, all kinds of programs and services such as the recreation programs. Together we can really build some solid good product, but on our own we're um, duplicating resources, we're wasting, and I think by working together we can really make sure that that doesn't happen. And I feel the same about our Stony Nakoda neighbors. We share a border, we need to build relationships, and that's the first key to making things happen and working together. Um, one of the relationships I've had with Rocky View in the past is through the FCSS program, Family and Community Support Services. So about 20 years ago, we created a long-standing partnership when I was the manager of FCSS. And it's an example of sharing resources providing res uh, services to the residents, things that they need, and residents generally don't care where the money's coming from. They just know what they need and they need to get it. So I think uh, that's where we start and I'd like to see more of that happening. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Marnie. Um, I think as a member sitting on this past council, um, obviously with seven different personalities sitting around a table, We've all learned what uh, having debate looks like, what uh, sometimes not agreeing with each other looks like, but at the end of the day, I think we all agree that in order to move projects forward, we all need to be working together around the table. Um, with Rocky View County specifically, I think we started off quite strong, um, trying to uh, extend the olive branch initially to kind of build that relationship, repair some of the damage maybe that was done over past years. Then COVID came in, uh, Rocky View County took on their own challenges within their own council, which made it very difficult um, to have any sort of forward moving uh, relationship. I think that what we have to be careful about as much as we want to work together, um, we also have to look at the resources that we have here in our own town, which is obviously education, our rec center. Um, and we have a great number of people that border on uh, our population. And so I think that we have to start asking some of the difficult questions, which aren't gonna be easy, but financially, how do we have a great relationship for both of us? Because it can't just be us coming to the table, uh, putting out uh, whether or not it's rec, rec opportunities, education opportunities, uh, shopping opportunities, without asking our neighbors what they're going to contribute uh, towards a long-term success for our own future as well. Thanks, Marty. Ryan, another minute. Sure thing. Yeah, I mean, it's great uh, as far as, uh, I appreciate what Susan brought up as far as the water rights. Um, that's another issue that's a really big deal that we're gonna have to work out with our neighbors as well. Um, there's a lot of issues that are, we're really gonna have to try to dig into with that. Um, and so we do have to try to reestablish that positive relationship. Sorry, did I misunderstand? I don't know if I misunderstood you or not, but if there was a slight breakdown, we have to find a way to reestablish that um, because we do have big challenges facing council uh, that we're gonna have to work out. And so, um, I mean, as far as working out the water rights, um, I think that's a really the, one of the really big things that I've been uh, campaigning on. So that's what we need to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Susan. I'd just like to add that I think the CMRB is going to be a real good avenue for us to work together. We're going to listen to each other and work out what works best for both communities. It's not to take away from anybody, but to plan together and make everything the best that it can be. And I guess I agree with Marnie that we need to make sure we're not paying for everything, but that's the point. We'll create relationships and negotiate and um, find a fair deal for both communities because there is a huge population in Rocky View and we need to make sure they're paying their fair share. Susan, for the benefit of those at home watching, what is CMRB? Oh, sorry. Um, Calgary Regional, CM, Calgary Metropolitan Regional Board. 
and that's a relatively new concept, although years ago everything was run regionally and then we went into towns running themselves and now we're moving back to having regional boards, but um, it's not about them controlling us, it's about planning together, making the best use of resources and the mayor has attended hundreds of meetings about this and I'm confident that we have a good plan in place. Good, thanks Susan. Marnie. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, it, it's true. I, I don't want to make it sound negative that we have some sort of bad, terrible relationship. We don't. We have to repair some damage, but we all have to move forward. We need to figure out what each community desires long term uh, now. And then, uh, like I said, how do we how do we financially benefit both? Right. I mean, we share borders, so we can't necessarily just be looking at our own needs. Rocky View, I don't think, can be considering their needs. We have to work together to find a compromise solution. Good. Thank you. Okay, I would ask uh, Tara, Erica, and Bruce, back up, please. Okay, this question is from uh, the public, from a gentleman uh, named Bill. How would you encourage the local business community to thrive as our town continues to grow? I'll start with you, Eric. I love this question. Um, I, I've been really focused on marketing as well and helping our small businesses thrive are not just through personal marketing, but marketing together as a collective has always been my idea. So not just using the chamber, which is a great focus, but also then using our economic development office as well. They've been, have been watching Mike work really great with the chamber and with other organizations, in, including the co-working space even, to collectively work together better with, it's more efficient, it's more resources. So to get those things out and to also not just for them as businesses and getting more sales, but also getting more value of employees and having employees that are right here too. Okay, thanks Erica. Tara. Yeah, uh, Bill, thanks for the question. I got my brain spinning, which I think is great. The, um, I think right now, like Cochrane is on the cusp of really amazing things happening. Um, when you look around town, you're seeing a lot of development permits being posted. We're seeing a lot of businesses getting ready. Even through COVID, we saw a lot of businesses stepping up and taking a chance and, and making things happen. So I think exciting things are happening for our local businesses. And so for those businesses that are looking to take the next step and to really thrive, um, you know, work with our chamber. They're a, a growing group that uh, is continuing to add more and more strength to our community. Um, also to work with our economic development office um, to provide those resources there. And uh, one of the ideas we've talked about over the years, but um, we have managed to get there, is to maybe work with the downtown group and see if we can create a business revitalization zone and see how we can bring the businesses together. Um, it's always about that collaboration, and I believe in creating those win-win-wins. So for the municipality, um, we can kind of bring people together, uh, reduce barriers, and when it comes to business, just get out of the way. Thanks, Tara. Bruce. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have to agree with, uh, with some of the comments that Tara's made and just to build on those, uh, I think uh, one of the things that we need to do is to get, get better at engaging our businesses and see what they want, what we can do to them to help promote their businesses, what we can do collectively across the town. Part of my platform that I've been uh, received a number of uh, questions and uh, comments on is uh, creating events in this town to draw the day tourists uh, out of Calgary and other parts of Alberta. And uh, two of the ideas that uh, I've put out there that um, have seemed to garner a considerable amount of interest is a, a Taste of Cochrane event where we, uh, we celebrate uh, the number of great restaurants and, and folks here in town to promote their businesses. Um, along the lines of what Tara mentioned about uh, you know, the, the downtown area and enhancing that and uh, shutting that down for a day or a weekend and uh, 
you know, uh, market this appropriately across uh, southern end of, uh, or south end of uh, Alberta to um, raise awareness, uh, I think is a good thing. Um, one of the other events that, uh, that I would look at, if given the opportunity to draw more people in, and it's been quite successful in many other parts of Canada, is a, a local busker fest. Uh, they uh, are uh, extremely popular right across this country and beyond, and I think uh, our community as a whole and our area is uh, very conducive to uh, hosting an event like that as well. But again, it's uh, about better marketing, it's about engaging our, our Chamber of Commerce, Cochrane Tourism, and other uh, key stakeholders, including the province, to uh, define better ways to market our town because I think it is, uh, some folks have already mentioned, we have a huge amount of potential here to do the right thing. And I think it's time now. Okay, thanks Bruce. Erica, another minute. Thanks. Um, so I'm coming from the perspective of being one of these small business owners and being a small business owner in this community. So that's where I see and have had those conversations and support. My key too is to let more people know that you can do almost everything here in Cochrane. There's a lot of people new to Cochrane, especially the ones who work in Calgary and have chosen to live here, think that they still have to go to the city. And getting more awareness out through using our chamber and our economic development, along with tourism working with them as well, letting people know that we have almost every single service as well as shop here. It's not just about the shopping in the downtown. There is a phenomenal amount of at-home businesses, especially since COVID that we can continue to support even more so than we do now. Thank you, Erica. Tara. Yeah, I don't have uh, too much to add. I think um, Cochrane is, we're blessed in so many ways. And uh, one of the ways that we are blessed is in a number of really uh, creative community events. So we have had a Taste of Cochrane before. I think there's an Oktoberfest booked for this month. I'm just making stuff up now. Um, <laughs> and yeah, there are some really great events from Light Up, um, our rodeo, so many reasons that people come to town. And uh, we can just build off of those type of things. One of the reasons, of course, um, that sometimes people avoid Cochrane on long weekends is our traffic. And uh, so just a, a shout out to our current council that has done so much work in investing in our traffic infrastructure to make it uh, easier to get to town and to make it easier for those of us who live here to enjoy it on those long weekends. So some big steps, um, an exciting time, and a real opportunity for Cochrane. Great. Thanks, Tara. Person. Yeah, again, uh, you know, we have uh, a really strong sense of community here in Cochrane. It's one of the, uh, the reasons that my wife and I decided to uh, spend the rest of our lives here. And I think we need to um, build on that. We need to tap the resources that we have in our community to find better ways to do things. Um, you know, I've heard several times tonight about the, you know, the enhancement of traffic. And, geez, I think we've got a long way to go before we can uh, claim any success there. So, uh, um, but yeah, that does hinder our ability to, uh, to promote our town. And I think uh, as a, if I'm given that opportunity, that's one area that I'm going to uh, make a huge priority in how can we engage the, you know, the, our communities to find better ways um, other than spending an enormous amount of money to, uh, to build ad ad additional infrastructure. I think there's other ways uh, that we can uh, alleviate some of the traffic uh, congestion here in town as well. But again, it's about engaging our community. It's about listening to our community and finding better ways to draw the, uh, the day tourist uh, out of Calgary and other parts of Alberta to uh, really show off our town. We have a lot to show off and we should be proud of it as Cochranites. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. So I would ask uh, Paul and Brandon to come up, please. Okay. It is often said that elected officials have many bosses. Uh, it requires a balancing act between competing interests and voices. You will be part of a council team with a governance relationship with town administration, but you're also elected to be a voice for the residents. Uh, and we know that we can't please everyone all of the time. 
So what can you tell us that demonstrates your competency and proficiency in how you would operate within such an environment? You first? Perfect. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. No, yes. <laughs> uh, no so it's, uh, it, it comes down to working with, uh, with everybody. Um, I think for everybody that's in here, uh, I pretty much well reached out to everybody first uh, in an attempt to build relationships. Uh, with the community, uh, with the incumbents, with the candidates. Uh, some I heard from right away, some I didn't get an opportunity to meet right away because they didn't follow kind of right to the last second, so unfortunately I didn't get to meet anybody uh, from that side of things. Uh, but I took the time to reach out and build those relationships and, uh, and, and, and I will continue to do that. Uh, it's important and I think that councillors meet outside of council uh, to discuss community matters. I was a little bit troubled to find out that a lot of uh, the incumbents don't meet outside of council. Um, and when matters are brought forward by the community or by the administration, I think it's important that councillors also step outside of the box and step outside of chambers, uh, meet together for a coffee, maybe just a couple of them, uh, and just discuss those you know, community matters. Uh, and you know, bring those to the other councillors and, uh, and continue to build on that foundation. So that's all I have for that. Okay, thanks, man. Paul? Oh, thanks for the question and thank you, Brandon, for adding. Uh, one of my pillars is uh, building partnership and uh, strengthening our community. And that's a, one platform I'm working on to that is I'm going to be flexible, adaptable, and engaging. If the circumstances changes, my priorities changes, and I have to be adaptable. I have to listen to the both sides and then make an informed decision as a council collectively. Working as a board member for Cochrane Society for Housing Options, I had a, it has given me the ability to work as a team member and working as a board on the Cochrane Immigrant Services Committee has given me the experience as a governance board. As Brandon mentioned, working in partnership and building relations, that's important, that you have to listen both sides of the story and then make informed decision for that. Thank you. Thank you. Brandon? Yep, no, I, have, I don't have anything else in regards to that. You don't have anything else? Nothing okay. else. No. Easy. Easy. I think it's, uh, like I said, I think it was important that I reached out to everybody that I could first and we build on those relationships and continue it. So one of, one of the parts of the question really spoke to asking you to articulate your competencies and proficiencies in this area yep. of uh, balancing multiple directions from multiple people Absolutely. and that responsibility. So do you have anything you want to add on that front? Uh, I've, I've worked uh, in the numerous management roles uh, over the years, so I worked at Suncor. Uh, there's a lot of Suncor folks in Cochrane that know this. Um, I've oversaw groups of 200 people by myself. Uh, I continue to build on those foundations. Um, everything that I've, I've taken out of my management roles was by being approachable, being accessible to people, uh, listening more so than, than anything to what it is that they had to say, and ensure that I was taking those concerns forward. And, uh, and I think the years of in those being those old management roles is what uh, this has kind of helped me put me in the position that I'm in today. Okay, thank you. Paul? I would add something like working here in Cochrane for the last seven years. I worked in retail as a management. I graduated from Humber College in management, hospitality management. It's all end up to being, and working with the board of uh, Cochrane Immigrant Services Committee, it adds to the thing that as a governing body, uh, we have to build that relationship and building, listening to both sides so we can make an informed decision as a council whole. That's what I Okay, thank you. Thanks to both of you. Thank you. Okay, Morgan, Susan, and Deborah. I did. Okay, this uh, question comes from Public Dave. One of the biggest problems in Cochrane is traffic. Setting aside the provincial project 
of the Highway 1A22 interchange, what is your plan over the next four years to fix traffic congestion? I'll start with you, Mark. Yeah, I have been advocating for investing in traffic infrastructure pretty much my entire time on council for the past eight years. Um, and I am pleased to say that our current mayor and council have made good progress in this area. Uh, we built the new Jack Tanner Memorial Bridge. We've upgraded Center Avenue. We partnered with the provincial government to upgrade uh, Center in 1A. And of course, the 1A22 upgrade is still coming down the, uh, the pipeline. Of course, this isn't going to be enough. Traffic need is something we're going to continue to need to invest, and invest in and plan towards. And uh, actually, one of my biggest campaign promises, which I've posted on Facebook about, I've emailed it out to my supporters, uh, we need to be doing a traffic study in the next term. We need to start planning for years in the future what is the next big project. And I know from experience that these projects can take years and years and years to get done. So even if we're not talking shovels in the ground in the next term, we need to be laying out the engineering uh, groundwork. We need to be looking at land acquisitions, perhaps, and budgeting for the next big project. Now, I personally think the next big project should be additional crossing at the railroad, uh, probably an underpass or overpass at Center Avenue in particular. But I am not going to go and say that uh, this is the project we're going to do. I'm going to snap my fingers. We're going to get it done. Instead, we need to go uh, consult with traffic experts. We need to do a study. We need to be calculated, and we need to be well thought out and uh, really just get creative and find what are the next big uh, problems. Thanks, Mark. Next big solutions. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, I pretty much agree with everything Morgan said. Um, we are going to be prepared to work on the roads for many years to come. We have to do a lot of planning. It costs a lot of money. So we have to really look at where all the funds are coming from. I'm excited that with our new transit hub, we're going to have a pedestrian crossing just at grade um, coming up in the near future. Um, lot more bike lanes. Um, more passing lanes, more parking. Parking is a big issue, and that's another study that we need to be doing for Cochrane. What is the best way to deal with the parking issues? Because every community is so different. Um, I think that we have a long, lot of catching up to do, but I'm also concerned about the social infrastructure. We can't let it lag behind. We need uh, new <coughs> seniors housing and affordable housing. So we have to find a way to balance all these funds out to make this a complete community, make sure there's something here to fill the needs for everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Bar. Well, when I came 33 years ago, one of the things we were smitten by was how <coughs> the roads were so wide and so empty, and you could drive from here to Lake Louise and maybe not meet anybody. And so what I've seen in, in Cochrane over the 22 years that I've lived here is that residential areas have gone up and um, the infrastructure, the, the traffic has not been considered, I think. There was no foresight on what was happening. I've heard from previous councillors that were councillors years ago that said there had been um, plans to have an underpass or an overpass on the railway. I feel that there's a lot of plans on the table. There's a lot of big plans on the table but what is most important is you can build them all and you can have do more residential areas, but once the train is going through town every 20 minutes and the traffic is backed up as far as God knows where I know that on Railway Avenue, it was backed right up against uh, our railway street right up to Railway Avenue the other day and coming out of certain areas like the Shoppers Drug Mark, you couldn't even get into the traffic lane. So I think that if you want to go further with more dwellings and everything like that, you have to take care of the underpass and overpass. We can spend millions and billions on everything else, but unless you take care of the traffic, you're only creating a bigger, a bigger mess. Thanks. Morgan. Um, adding to the conversation, I would uh, also say that transportation solutions in Cochrane uh, aren't just about vehicles. And as we continue to get a grapple on uh, roadways for vehicles, we need to be also looking at connectivity for pedestrians and bikes. And uh, I believe that in Cochrane, we need to set a very real goal of making sure that every single community in Cochrane has both enjoyable and safe pedestrian and bike access in and out of Cochrane. And there are communities up in the hills, we all know that if their kids want to walk into town, it's extremely dangerous. We also know there's places where you're, when you're walking around town at nighttime, you have to go down into a park, which is again, very dangerous. I'm talking about like Griffin Road. Uh, this is something we cannot allow to exist in Cochrane any longer. We need to get very serious about making sure that you can walk or bike anywhere through Cochrane from anywhere. Thanks, Mark. Susan. 
Two, two things I'd like to address. Um, the underground, uh, under the railway or over the railway, we've talked about at length on council. It is millions and millions of dollars. Cochrane just doesn't have the population to support that. If we would do that now, there's so many other projects we wouldn't be able to do. And the other negative aspect is that it would take away from our downtown core because you need so much land at either end of the crossing that um, people wouldn't be able to turn into the downtown core and they would exit right past it. So there has been many discussions around it and I just don't see it in our near, near future. Um, I am very proud of the Colt bus service that we put in. It's another uh, solution to transit. The province had given us some money and if we hadn't gotten it done, we'd have to give the money back, which would be crazy when we have all these transportation issues. So it's in place, we're tweaking it as we go. Of course, COVID uh, messed it up there for a year and a half and when we were just getting the momentum going. But now we're looking at some regular routes. We're gonna get the young adults to school so they can go to university and college. Thank you. Good. Well, I hope Thanks. I have more than two minutes for this one. <laughs> no, actually you don't, you have <laughs> half that. You oh have one my God. Minute. Well, number one, the coal bus is costing us 750000 a year. We got $9 million between grants and this, that and the other. Um, just because a grant is presented to you doesn't necessarily mean you should use it. You should look and see, well, what is it going to cost me after I implement what the grant was for? And so now we have a $750,000 a year um, that the taxpayer is paying for. And I'd like to know the how much you're actually making on it and how it's paying for itself. Um, Yes, I know that I don't, I don't claim to be an expert on anything and everything, but I do know when, when people get around the table together and you discuss something, one may have an idea and not know how to implement it. That's why all the council members bring something to the table. But the ideas have to come. You cannot keep building it and having more traffic. We have kids ready to get new cars and it's just going everywhere. You've got to stop at some stage, take a look in your rearview mirror and see can you take care of what you have. And, and that's where it is, even the primary care. You have to take care of what we have and not just be looking to the next thing and the big thing. So there was Thank no pun intended when you said look in the rearview mirror, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, Samantha, and Alex. Okay, Cochrane has increased 93% in population over just the last decade. As the community has grown, there has been an addition of many kilometers of roadways and pathways, acres of park space, infrastructure upgrades. Cochrane residents demand a high level of service delivery. How will you ensure the town, as an organization, is equipped to handle the expectation of its residents? I'll start with you, Samantha. Thank you for the question. Um, so I guess this high level of service delivery that Cochranites expect, it means people care and they want their stuff looked after. So that's really important because um, we all invest in it. So uh, looking after it makes sense. Um, now, I think some of the problems stems from people feeling disconnected. So what, when we feel like we're out of the loop or we haven't been included, we feel angry. And I think that's kind of the root of some of the problems. Um, as a team, we need to make sure that the community feels involved in our decisions. Um, but we also must inform the constituents of bad news as well. They can't all be good. And we have to explain the reasons behind things. And I feel like that's why people have these expectations and they want to hold us accountable to it. But maybe we're not doing the work in making them feel included. Um, so I think that ultimately people just want to be heard, they want to be seen, they want to be validated. And I think that um, to ensure that expectation, we need to talk and we need to include them in the really big decisions, like wave parks and stuff. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks, Samantha. Alex. Yeah, um, my response is going to be similar to uh, the first question that we had. 
Uh, <clears throat> you know, it is a flash of the blinding obvious that the town has not kept pace with the infrastructure, and uh, that has created some challenges. So how would I ensure that the town as an organization is equipped to handle the expectations of residents and as it continues to grow in the next four years? It's really based on what we've done to date. And uh, I think we've done a good job. Uh, basically, we, as a council, would get together based on the kind of experiences that we bring to the table, draft our priorities, share that with the public and get feedback. And that's really informed feedback. And it's difficult, right? I mean, <clears throat> um, the first year of my term, I did a lot of research and public engagement and discovered that no one community has found the answer to that. But I think we were all, we've gone a long way to do that. So we would take the feedback we've got from uh, the public as it relates to our priorities, we'd refine that, create a budget, resource it appropriately to those priorities, and then manage it prop uh, appropriately, appropriately. I mean, striking the balance between what a community wants and what it can afford is the work of town council. That's our job. And this is the experience that comes into play in such a critical role. So as I said before, the kind of infrastructure needs that uh, we have, and I want to emphasize those because I had forgot a few. Uh, in the next 20 years, obviously a traffic study, the, the kind of things that we talked about um, in relation to the traffic infrastructure and have a 20 year lens to look through that. The 24 seven urgent healthcare unit, again, another uh, priority that's important to our community. We're of a size where we need to be able to address that. Localize ambulance services. We can't afford to have our ambulances in, in the city. Uh, water rights, we've talked about. <laughs> I forgot re about replacing the Big Hill Lodge. That's really important to our seniors. Um, and the need to address affordable housing. We've talked about outdoor recreation, uh, pathways, dog parks, and bike, thing, uh, bike lanes. But the, the main thing is to be able to balance what feedback we're receiving, identify those priorities, and then go after them appropriately. Thanks, Bill. Tucker. Thank you, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, I'm, I'm proud of where our last council was on this one. Um, at any given time, government doesn't operate in a competitive, competitive environment. It doesn't have free market discipline. We need to find efficiencies, that's what council does. That's our job is to make sure that we're delivering effective services to our residents for the best possible value that we can. I think we did a good job of that as the last council, uh, being prudent and respecting our finances. Um, we, we didn't see tax increases that uh, exceeded inflation at any point, even during a COVID pandemic, we kept finances in check. I thought um, that's something that I'm proud of and I'd like to see continue. And, and most importantly, like I had kind of with my last question, we need to make sure that growth is paying for growth in this town um, to continue to deliver services to residents that are efficient and of the quality that they expect. We need to make sure that our offsite levies are collecting appropriate amounts and to make sure that every new resident to Cochrane is a net benefit to our current residents. And that's uh, the number one concern I have as a councillor running for re-election again, that I think we can do a better job there and uh, continue to do what we've done with our financial prudence, I think, in our last four years. Okay, thanks, Tucker. <coughs> Samantha. Thank you. Um, I think the only rebuttal I have is that I just want to congratulate our current incumbents. I think that you have done the best job that you can do given that it's been COVID. Um, I personally have loved that everything is live streamed. I eat it up and I watch it all. Um, but I, I appreciate that. And I think that as a, a voter, um, I, I've learned so much just during COVID because it is televised or live streamed for lack of a better word. But uh, I think that that's been really great. And I hope that everybody in Cochrane has seen value in that as well. And I hope that you guys can get back to that face-to-face -face public engagement soon. Thank you. Thanks, Samantha. Yeah, I would just pick up on the theme of uh, live streaming. I think this council has done a very good job of listening to residents. Live streaming is just one example, but our communications department has gone overboard in terms of being able to explain what we do and how we do it, right? This is what we do with your tax dollars. This is what it costs. This is the difference between a school board tax and a town tax. This is where your dollar is going. And, I, and you know, kudos to our communication department and our team. And again, that direction of council setting its priorities uh, with a strategic vision of its future. And, and I think, admittedly, I think we've done a really good job. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Patrick? Uh, last point I'd point out would, would be again just to talk about when we're, when we're talking about managing our, our growth to be able to pay for things because that's the the essence of the question that uh, I'd like us to do things slightly differently uh, going forward as a, as a council and that's when we're evaluating new growth I'd like to take a more expanded lens and make sure we're calculating things like a like a business decision where 
we want to make sure that our profits have to uh, be larger than our liabilities or we're diminishing ourselves and we're going to run into a situation eventually where we can't provide the service level that we currently do. Um, so uh, that's, that's where I can see improvement in the future. Otherwise, I think we've done a good job the last four years on this. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. Fitness equipment, that'd be another good one. Okay, I'd ask uh, Dan, Alan, and Todd to come up, please. It's the last three and the last question of the season. So this is a uh, public question from Renita. Being a town councillor means you have to make a decision one way or another on sometimes divisive topics. What are the steps and processes you would take to make your decision? I'll start with you, Todd. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, Anita and town residents. Thanks for the question. Um, you, at the first part, listening is key for me. You have to listen to what's coming into council, get all the details that you can initially, and then you have to ask questions for missing details. Sometimes you don't get all the information even with those questions, so you might need to go beyond that and do some additional checking. And then that's where I start. And then you said, the, can you just re repeat it one more time for me? Uh, it, it means making a decision one way or another as a councillor on divisive topics and what steps and processes would you take to make your decisions? Okay, so I explained the first step for sure. Um, you do go a little bit with your moral compass, your ethical, and what you're bringing to the table that way as well, so that weighs into it. Um, if it's a decision on the spot, um, I have to do all that very quickly and make it. Otherwise, I might have a chance to ask for some opinions out there. I've got some good people in my network. My wife's one. And sometimes that balances my perspective if, if there's that opportunity. But if I have to make a decision right there and then, it's the listening part, re-identifies that. All the information was pulled in there. I also listened to what different, say, council members, what they're putting on the table and what, how they're taking it in. And then I process that all together, use, like I said, your morals, your ethics, and I'll make a definitive decision one way or the other. And I always want that decision to be the best for the residents on the whole, um, me being one of them, for our community, for the environment, I take all that into account. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Alan. First thing I'd w I wanna do, um is, is discussed with the public. Uh, it's, it's important that we uh, have public consultation and, and two-way two -way public consultation. So uh, myself off, offering different perspectives and, and try, trying, to drive, um, trying to drive the conversation. Something that, that uh, I can document, uh, take to the administration, get their feedback, and then, and then bring it to council and, and have a very effective conversation and uh, have the mayor lead that. <laughs> um, I want to trust my gut to do the right thing. I, I think that's very important. And, and, and that's why I, I think I should, I'm a good candidate to be elected, is, uh, is trust my gut. Okay, thanks Al. Dan. Well, the broad overstrokes of this are basically you listen, you have engagement, you synthesize that initial information. You plan around that information. You revisit and refocus. Basically, um, the, the way to describe that approach would be a corkscrew approach. You're not going to get it right the first time, but you don't give up on the idea. And uh, the, the, the key part of that is also engagement. Now, 
one of the things that I think puts that's that, that's um, important here as well as would be my experience with this and you know I ran in 2013 and 2017 and I, I missed being voted in uh, 2017 by nine votes um, I've been talking and following council ma council matters for over 10 years um, one of the things I continue to hear from people is I didn't know that I didn't no, I didn't know I could be part of that or now it's I know that but it's too late so I think consultation while I'll admit that this uh, current council has taken some steps forward does have a long way to go I prefer a, a boots on the ground sort of approach here um, especially when you're talking um, rezoning applications or something like that where someone has bought a homeowner or, or an agency or uh, uh, an organization has a vested interest in something they have an inherent right, in my belief, to have a, a greater part in, in the discussions that might happen when something's revisited. For example, something like the Jones Estate. That, that has been come and gone, and it needs to be gone away. Um, and ultimately, I do have a plan around that as well. I don't have the time right now to get into it. Bottom line is, throughout my experience with uh, over 20 years in, in government of Alberta, I've had different departments. All of those have involved conflict, but all of those involved working with multidisciplinary teams to find a solution approach, uh, uh, the best solution, and I'm focused on, I just got timed up. Thank you. Thank you. Todd, one more minute. Sure. And are we back to the same question? That yep. working yep. on? Or, or contest what you heard? Yeah, I heard that. I'm a big part of my background and the work I've done for municipalities and going right back to my early days doing similar work for nonprofits and affiliated organizations to municipalities is research is key for me. Um, you have to do a lot of research and you have to make sure the right questions are asked at the table and hopefully we get the right people with the right experience sitting at that table. And then you can utilize all the different um, backgrounds, experiences, and viewpoints to help you make the decisions. That's where I come from. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Todd. Alan? One thing I've noticed since uh, COVID-19 is, is the, the town's approach to communication. Um, they, they, they're really focusing on, on getting the message out to, to what they're doing, uh, the budgets, um, they have an online feedback form. Um, what I would like to see is, is something that we have been missing um, is, is a lot of those forums have been uh, through trade shows, for, for instance, with the recycling. Um, I'd really like to, to, to have administration explore something to, to make sure that that message gets out and, and so the public can, can give that feedback. And uh, I, th I think that, that's one of the important things that uh, I think that's just missing with, with what they've done so far. Yeah. There, there was a comment about research here now um, and gut feelings. Now, the person, um, ultimately, there's a social worker saying the person is political, which means that we come with inherently some biases and that um, we come with a certain approach. Now, we need to recognize what our biases might be and make sure that those don't influence what we do at town council here. So I think research... By all means, we need to do that, but it also needs to be objective as well. You know, my platform was has been around um, ensuring that, uh, well, ensuring public uh, spending and controlling debt, and um, one of the biggest parts of this is taking action. I've been at this for 10 years. Part of my research involves the ongoing conversations I've had with people for 10 years. I'm the one candidate here that probably has one of the, the, the broadest and most, most in-depth platforms. And I would hope to hope have your vote on October 18th. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. So there you have it, Cochrane. That was the candidates, and uh, as a uh, resident of Cochrane, let me uh, offer my sincere thanks to each of you for having the courage and the conviction to run uh, and represent this community in municipal government. 
Uh, it's not like uh, uh, the federal party where you do two terms and you have a nice pension for life. That is not the case here. Uh, you are not going to get rich being a councillor, but you are going to uh, represent this community. And uh, I thank you very, very much for stepping forward and, uh, and putting your name in the hat. So thank you very much. And thank you to you, uh, Stephen. We really appreciate you moderating the evening tonight. You did a fantastic job. And uh, thank you so much for tuning in to the Cochrane and District Chamber of Commerce Municipal Election Debate. Um, thank you to Cochrane Toyota for hosting us this evening. And thanks to all the candidates for joining us here tonight as well. If you missed any of, uh, any of the debate this evening, you can go back and watch the video on CochraneNow.com at any point. And... That's about it. Thanks so much.